morning on this blessed Easter morning. The Lord is risen, and he is risen indeed. We'll begin with our meditation verse for the morning of Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning at our online service for Mount Airy Presbyterian Church, and we would pray and hope that it would be a blessing and an encouragement for your faith this morning. We'll call to worship is from John in chapter 1 and verse 29, as it begins with John the Baptist speaking. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And then from Revelation chapter 5 and 13, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And now let us all together give praise to our God with these songs.
Let us pray. Our Father in God, how we rejoice to come to you on this Sabbath morning, this Easter morning, where we celebrate indeed that your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you have empowered by the Holy Spirit and raised him from the dead, that he lives, that he rules over his church in this world. And even though it seems out of control at times, King Jesus has proved who he is by his word in saying that he would arise in three days from the dead, and indeed he has. Not only has he risen, but he's ascended into heaven, where you now, O oh Jesus, serve as King and Lord of heaven and earth. So we come to give ourselves to you today in worship, rejoicing to be your children because of the promise that was given by the Father from the beginning and worked out by the Spirit through the ages and now fulfilled in Christ. How we thank you and rejoice to be those who follow after you, strengthen and build up your church today, we pray, because of Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Luke, uh, the 23rd chapter in verse 52 to chapter 24 in verse 12. This man, Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid it in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the pre day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, they were perplexed about this. And behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed down their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the leaven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. Let us adore our great God and Savior Jesus Christ as we sing number hymn number 273, Jesus Christ is risen today.
And now, let us responsibly read Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 3 through 12. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one who from men hid their faces, was despised, and we esteemed him not. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. He opened not his mouth. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for transgressors. Let us now, together, confess our sin unto the Lord. We'll begin with a time where you might quietly, we will quietly confess our sins to the Lord, and then I'll uh, pray for all of us. Before we do this, let me prepare us to confess our sins by reading from Jeremiah chapter 17 and verses 13 and 14. O Lord, the hope of Israel... All who forsake you shall be put to shame, and those who turn away from you sh shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. O oh God, we know that we are such children of yours, that we still rebel daily in sin and thought and word and deed. You've called us not only to follow the commands outwardly, but also from our hearts. And we find ourselves so easily going after the ways of the world, those baubles of the world, those bright lights, those things that we think would please us and fill our needs more than you would. And so we thank you that through Christ you have encouraged us. You've called us to come back and confess our sins. And when we do that, that through the blood of Christ, as we remember his finished work for us, that he has not only died for our sins for the past and even today, but in the future. And there and in him is our hope. So we confess indeed our sins to you and rejoice that we come to you now, O oh God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, boldly into your throne room and know that because of his finished work on the cross, that he is not only indeed risen from the dead, but ascended into heaven 
and is ruling and reigning for our good and your glory. And it's for in, in Christ that we pray. Amen. Together, let us sing the hymn of assurance, Up from the Grave He Arose. Now let us come before the Lord with thanksgiving and bringing our prayers to him for his good will to be done for his people. Our God and Father, we give you our heartfelt thanks for your daily mercies during these trying times in our state and nation and around the world as we are seeking to fight the coronavirus and deal with the physical and emotional and financial casualties from it. We are humbled how quickly that you can take what we call greatness of the nations and make them minuscule and take what we call strong and show us that we are weak. But as we look to you and call out to you, we find that you're not only able to bring us through in Christ, but to thrive as we look to you and live. May we seek you daily and honor your name by showing your love and grace to those in our families and church and neighbors. Lord, we do ask for the wisdom needed for our national leaders, the president and his cabinet and the Corona Task Force and 
uh, the economic task force they are beginning to lead and set up. We fight, we pray also, Lord, for our state governor, Mr. Hogan, and ask that you would help him to know about schools beginning or continuing to be closed and us out and around or be going back to work. All those terribly important situations and also with our local leaders. And oh God, we ask for your mercies to be great to those who are serving in the front lines at hospitals and EMTs and police and so many other first responders who are working long hours with um, often not even the proper equipment, but going into the fray and uh, serving and uh, that others might live. Lord God, we would ask for you to not only help them, but that we would be appreciative to them. Of course, we pray for so many who are sick that you might, in the midst of it, uh, be merciful to them and and uh, give them life and healing. And we would pray for so many families grieving at this time, that they would think about life and death and eternal life, and that you would be in the midst, and that your people would come with loving care and comfort, and that even during these difficult and hard times, you would be glorified. We thank you for the missionaries that uh, are still uh, at work and in transition even. We thank you for the Johnsons who have been spent many years in the Czech Republic and yet are coming home. And at this time when everything is uh, topsy-turvy, uh, ending their missionary careers and seeking to find out how you would use them in this stage of life, and especially with Annette having to care for her aged mother who is in poor health, give them wisdom and grace and strength and provide for them as they uh, seek to be settled in an unsettled time. And how we thank you that you have uh, been faithful to help the Zells, uh, M Matthew and Ellen in Honduras, uh, in, as they continue to minister to a country that is shut down and has little um, to help them with the particular needs and the overwhelming uh, numbers of people sick and in crowded hospitals and the, even people that they know and minister to help them. I know that they would, uh, if you allow, would like to come home and uh, to the States and see their families and care for them. And yet uh, that's impossible at this time. Give them uh, faith and rest and trust in you as they continue to love others for Christ's sake. And would you use that kind of care to have your gospel go forth? We thank you that Cornerstone Academy is indeed up and running online, continue to give wisdom and help to students and teachers as they use a whole new form of learning that they hadn't uh, been using near as much. And there are glicks and different kinds of difficulties to work out at first, but we thank you that they're able to do that. And we pray for their financial needs during this time when uh, it's hard for some to pay tuition when you're just trying uh, to get to work and get your weekly pay. So, Lord, we ask your power to be great in this and for the hearts of your people as they serve to be strengthened and for you to provide all that they need. Lord, you know that uh, we have ministered in the past uh, for a long time at the Pleasant View Nursing Home, and they've had so many deaths there, and so many of the workers sick, and uh, so much going on, so many hardships. Lord, uh, be uh, cause your people who are there to be lights in the midst of a hard and difficult time and place and uh, use this for your glory. Uh, we all become aware as we tend to not want to think about life and death, and, uh, and yet uh, you bring this to the forefront, and uh, we pray that you would uh, receive uh, glory in this as we 
uh, find out our own weakness and look to you for life, eternal life and strength. And we ask that uh, you would particularly help us know how we might uh, continue to reach out to friends and people we've gotten to know and minister to, both parents and children at Mainly Music, and our students with uh, learning the English language at ESL. Um, we thank you for all of them. We know that they have the same kind of trials and difficulties as the rest of us, and how we pray that they would uh, remember things they've heard and and uh, see how we've trusted you and call upon Jesus uh, to help them, even as their Lord and Savior. Oh God, uh, we would ask for our elders and deacons as they've had to make so many changes to help us all continue to worship, even in this way now. And we would ask for your strengthening of them. We thank you that they're calling uh, their shepherding groups and trying to meet to small groups uh, um, by Zoom and all these ways. And uh, we thank you for the way they've reached out. Encourage them as they're still serving in the midst of the extra pressures and difficulties they have in life. And bless them, Lord, as they encourage us. And we pray especially for our Pastor Dave as he's had uh, many new things to learn during this time and uh, sermons to come quicker uh, in the week than before and a whole change of things as he seeks even to care for the sheep. Bless and encourage him and his dear wife and um, that they would be continually encouraged in Christ and used by you. And Lord, we pray all these things in the name and because of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us together praise God as we sing the doxology. Let us sing our song of dedication as we continue in our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ with number 285, Worship Christ, the Risen King.
Good morning. This is the Resurrection Day, and it is our custom to say responsibly these words. He is risen. He is risen indeed. This morning, our text is from the book of John, and the title of our message is Our Life and Christ's Resurrection. These past weeks have been difficult. The days are difficult because of a disease that brings death to many, and with death, grief, and sorrow, and loss. These are hard things to bear. And even the fear that these things will arrive at our doorstep and enter into our lives is hard because this fear can steal away hope and joy. And we wonder, when will it ever end? And every time we keep our distance, our six feet from other people, and put on a mask or wash our hands, we are reminded of the disease and the sorrow and the fear. We as Christians know that we are not to live in fear. We know what fear can do and how it can take away hope and joy and with them also the power to love. Fear works on us to make us think more about ourselves and about our own family and less about others. For all these reasons, we need the message of Easter, the message of the resurrection, because it is a message of joy and of hope and of love. And I am so thankful to have this message to share with you at this time. However, there is one great hurdle to overcome. And that is the hurdle of our believing in the miracle of the resurrection. The hope, joy, and love found in the resurrection are lost if we lack the faith to believe in the resurrection. And there are many enemies to such faith in this world. There are false religions that would have us believe that we can be saved by our works, by our own righteousness and goodness. And so we do not need the death and resurrection of Jesus. They may say that we need his example to follow, but surely we do not need such a great salvation. And then there is the word of higher education and the world of modern science that says that we do not need a personal, all-wise creator to explain how the world came to be. And we don't need his Christ. We have outgrown religions based on ignorance and superstition. We have evolution and other scientific explanations. And then there is the unbelieving heart within our own flesh that would point to our own experience. We all know that the dead, the irretrievably dead, those who have been dead for days, do not come back to life on their own. These are the real obstacles to faith, but particularly the last one. Even the 11 disciples and the others who followed Jesus knew that the dead do not bring themselves back to life. They had faith in God and they had the Old Testament Bible, and it was clear from the Old Testament that no one ever came back to life on their own. A great prophet like Elijah or Elisha on occasion brought someone back to life. But even that person later died. 
No one, not even Moses, ever came back to life on their own. No one ever overcame death. Death was God's judgment on sinners. And everyone died because everyone was a sinner. And if Jesus died, then they concluded, his disciples and those who followed him, concluded that he too must have sinned. And this only added to their confusion because they had thought that he was their promised Messiah. No one ever brought themselves back to life. And this is why the women came with burial spices on Sunday morning. They expected to find his dead body there. And the eleven disciples were no different. They did not expect him to rise from the dead, even though Jesus had told them he would. When he told them that he would, they did not understand his words. And they thought that he was speaking in parables because a resurrection had never happened before. And because, also, the picture, uh, his death did not fit into their picture of the Messiah, the Christ. So, what changed their minds? If you think that it was seeing Jesus alive from the dead, you would be wrong, or at least mostly wrong. Seeing Jesus helped, but seeing is not believing, despite the saying. In Matthew 28, verse 17, we read that there were some who saw Jesus alive in Galilee, but still they doubted and did not believe. It is not seeing that brings about faith. It is hearing God's word. Just as Christ wrote in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. When the women came to the tomb that morning and found it empty, what was it that brought faith to their hearts? It was when the angel said in Luke 24, verses 6 through 8, He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. In Matthew and in Mark, we also find the angels reminding the women what Jesus had said. God's word, that is, the words of Jesus, brings about faith because God's word has power. Power to create all things out of nothing and power to create faith. I would encourage you to read Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 36, where Peter spoke to the crowds on the day of Pentecost, testifying to them about the resurrection of Christ. And you will find him quoting from the Old Testament scriptures, proving that his resurrection was the fulfillment of God's written word. Having heard God's Old Testament promises about the resurrection of Christ, about 3,000 believed and were baptized on that day. When we hear God's word in faith, we hear it not simply with the ears, but with the soul. We hear it and we know in our soul that this word is truth. And that this word comes from God himself. And so when we hear and read the words from Matthew's gospel, he is risen just as he said. We recognize whose voice it is and whose testimony it is. And that this is God's testimony. And yet, for us to know why and how 
the resurrection is such a source of joy and comfort to us, we need to turn to other scriptures. And so let us turn to John chapter 10, verses 14 through 18. And this is God's words, the word of Christ. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank and praise you for your love for sinners like us in sending your Son into the world. We thank and praise you for such a great salvation, a salvation that, that sinners like us so desperately need. And we thank you for his resurrection and the power of his resurrection. And we praise and thank you that your word is truth and we ask that your Spirit will speak to our hearts that we may hear and believe and find our comfort and our joy in your truth about Jesus. This we pray in his name. Amen. Well, for us, the key verse in this passage is verse 17 where Jesus speaks of his resurrection. First, we notice that his resurrection is something that he does, that he makes happen. He raises himself from the dead. In verse 18, Jesus emphasizes how he is in absolute control of his death and his resurrection because he has authority over them given to him by his Father. He emphasizes how this is true in his death because to the disciples it will seem as if his enemies are the ones in control as they beat and scourge and crucify him. But these things were happening to him according to his own will. In these things, God's wrath against our sin was poured out on him, just as Isaiah 53 foretold. In these things, Jesus was laying down his life as the sacrifice for our sins so that we might be forgiven and reconciled to God. But our forgiveness and our reconciliation with God was not the real goal in what he did. Jesus came to give us life. And so his real goal was not accomplished in his death, but in his resurrection. A few verses earlier, in verses 10 and 11, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then he says in verse 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. The language is quite clear in the Greek. In verse 17, Jesus said, He did something in order that he might do something else. He lay down his life in order that he might take it up again. 
He died in order that he could raise himself from the dead because we are not made alive by means of his death. We are forgiven by means of his death. We are made alive by means of his resurrection. And this is why he came, that we might have life and have it abundantly. In the New Covenant, we are joined to Christ in a mystical union so that we become one with Christ. And in this union, his death becomes our death and his resurrection becomes our resurrection. Jesus died so that in him we would be forgiven as justice is fulfilled. And Jesus raised himself up from the dead so that as he is, as he is raised up, so we would be raised up to new life in him. We had to be, be, be forgiven before we could be glorified, which meant that Jesus had to die before he could be raised up from the dead. His death served to bring about his resurrection. He died in order to raise himself up from the dead because the desire of God's heart is to give us life, abundant life. And all this points to his true identity. He is not a mere man. He is God and he is man. In John 1, we read that he is the Word and that the Word created all things and that the Word is God and that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's verse 14 of John 1. Literally, he lived as in a tent. This is how the Bible describes God living as a man. Now, a tent is temporary. A tent is an inadequate temple for God to live in. Even Solomon's temple was inadequate. For a time, the Son of God tabernacled in a flesh nature similar to ours, but without sin. However, the Son of God has not taken up residence permanently in, in that dwelling place. He has taken up residence permanently in a new dwelling place. And that dwelling place is immortal, imperishable, and indestructible. It is his resurrection body, a body that he changed into a spiritual body when he raised himself from the dead. He raised that body up for him to, to live in forever. A spiritual, sinless, imperishable body is what Jesus has planned for us. And this is why he rose from the dead. The Son of God could have returned home to heaven to live there as he was before he came to earth and was conceived in Mary's womb. Before he came, he had no body. And when he returned, he could have returned without a body. But he came to save us and give us life and to make all things new and to make his home our home. He came to raise us up from the dead in a spiritual body that is fit for heaven. And he did this by joining himself to us in our sin and by giving us faith so that we might be joined to him in his resurrection so that we would live with him and be with him forever. Every one of us who believes in Jesus believes that he is forgiven and cleansed of his sins. Why? Because we have God's promise on it. In John 1, 9, we read, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
When we confess our sins in repentance and faith, we know that we have his forgiveness. And we know that we have peace with God. Again, we have God's promise on it. In Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We know how broken we are within, in our flesh. We know how powerless we are to change ourselves. We know how weak our faith can be. And we know how dependent we are on Christ, on the Holy Spirit, on God, and that without Him, we can do nothing. But again, we have His promise that He will finish what He has begun, and that He will never leave us but that he will be with us always. And, and we can wonder, why? Why is this so? I mean, we, when we look at ourselves in the light of truth, we cannot give an answer. But this we know by faith, that because he died and because we, we have called upon him in faith for salvation, that we are his and he is ours. Do you know God's forgiveness? Do you know peace with God? Do you know that Jesus saves? Listen and hear the word of God from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. As Jesus said to Thomas, may Jesus also say to you, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Our God saves, and he saves with a great salvation. The one who is the good shepherd is Jesus, our Lord. He became one with us. The Son of God took on our flesh, our flesh nature, in order to redeem us and sanctify us and purify us from our sins. And he rose from the dead in a new body, so that we might be like him, so that we might inherit and receive a body like his, imperishable, sinless, and perfect. And he still dwells in that body now and for eternity, that we might know God, that we might know him, and that we might know the love that he has for us. We have God's word on it. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, we praise you. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise you that Jesus rose from the dead and that Jesus lives and is seated at your right hand now in heaven, and he is coming again. We praise and thank you that upon his return, we will be raised up, and we will be like him, with a body like his, and we will be with him 
and you, Father and Holy Spirit, forever and ever, sharing with him the joy that we have in your love. Lord, we thank you and praise you. We ask your blessing this Easter. Give us the comfort, hope, and joy, and love found in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. And now let us join together in singing a hymn of praise and triumph. Christ the Lord is risen today. receive God's benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.